You are all set, Vice Mayor. All righty, thank you. Thank you all for joining us this evening. We are here for an ARPA workshop to discuss the American Rescue Plan. And um, thank you for joining us all. I will be the chair of the meeting tonight. Mayor Benke is at an event at the Burma Center this evening. They have a ribbon cutting. Um, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the organization, but it has to do with early childhood education. And so he'll be out there representing the commission this evening at that event. Um, let's go ahead and take roll. And when you're responding, commissioners, please remember to state where you're joining us from. Vicki, if you could start roll. Commissioner Blood. Present, attending remotely from Battle Creek, Michigan, Calhoun County. Um, Vice Mayor Ferris. Present, attending from Battle Creek, Michigan. Commissioner Herring. Present, attending from Battle Creek, Michigan. Commissioner Lance. Present, <coughs> reporting remotely from South Haven, Michigan. Commissioner Morris. Present, attending remotely from Battle Creek, Michigan. Commissioner Reynolds. Present, attending remotely from the city of Battle Creek, Michigan. <coughs> Commissioner Sophia. Present, attending remotely from Battle Creek, Michigan. Commissioner Zenda Wilson. Present, attending remotely from Battle Creek, Michigan. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And thank you all for being here. Uh, next up, we have public comment on our agenda. If you'd like to join us for public comment, we ask that you phone in. The area code is 312-626-6799. Again, that is 312-626-6799. Once you've called in, they'll ask for a meeting ID number. That ID number is 84-3976-13417. Again, 84-3976-13417. Once you've called in, you'll be placed in a virtual waiting room. If you would like to speak for public comment, please uh, press star nine. And then when you're called upon, probably by the last four digits of your phone number, press star six to unmute yourself. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to our IT director. Do we have anyone out now for a public comment? I don't see anybody with their hands up, Vice Mayor, but we did have a caller just call in um, if you'd like to check with them. Um, okay, maybe they missed some it. It, The last four digits are 7299. If that caller would like to make public comment, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, my name is Will Fobbs uh, with CCG, Catalyzing Community Giving. Um, and so I, I think that I may be uh, speaking um, on, on the agenda, but I just wanted to uh, uh, introduce myself. Great, thank you for joining us this evening. And yeah, we'll, we'll go to you later on the agenda. Thank you so much. Of course. Anyone else with public comment? I do not see any hands, Vice Mayor, and that was our only caller. All right, I don't see anyone either. So we'll go ahead to the next item on our agenda, which is the ARPA overview. And for that, I'll turn it over to our city manager, Rebecca Flurry. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor Ferris and commissioners. Um, it's an exciting time to be with you tonight to actually have our first conversation about the American Rescue Plan Act um, and some of the uh, focuses that the city is considering. Sarah, can you put the presentation up? Um, yes, just one second, Rebecca. Okay. Thanks, we'll just get one moment because the presentation will guide us. But really our agenda, um, I'm gonna do a really quick overview of ARPA, um, but Linda Morrison, our finance director and Ted Deering, our assistant city manager, we're gonna kind of tag team for the presentation, um, but we've also invited some of our community partners and they will be talking very specifically about the priority projects. And so when we get to that area, we, we will certainly recognize um, our, our guests to be able to, to speak a little bit about those projects. Then we're going to um, go through the staff recommendations and all this information has been provided to the commissioners. And after this workshop, we'll make sure that it gets put up on the city's website so it's available to the public. So as anybody has questions, comments or concerns, they can reach out to the city manager's office um, once we get that information up. 
Um, please note that this is kind of the first conversation about the American Rescue Plan Act and the funds that have been awarded to the city of Battle Creek. Um, and that we anticipate several conversations as we kind of work through um, the process. We certainly have three years, according to the act, to um, commit funds or encumber funds, if I, if, if I can use some finance terms. Um, and then we have five years in which to spend the funds. Um, but as any federal source of funds goes, there's very heavy reporting requirements. As a matter of fact, our first report was due today. <laughs> So um, Linda Morrison and I worked diligently to get through the, um, let's say, the heavy security systems at the federal government uh, to be able to submit that report. It was a tag team duo effort. Um, and so we're happy to, to report that uh, that report was submitted on time. And really what it says was we have not expended any American Recovery Plan or Rescue Plan Act dollars um, as of the date. Um, it was due through activities of July, July 31st, I believe that's correct. Thank you very much, Sarah. I appreciate that. If you could advance. Thanks. So there, I, I started to go through the agenda a little bit. Um, after staff recommendations, we will talk about the priority projects in general. Then I'll talk a little bit about our use of our priority-based budgeting analysis, um, brand new. And so, you know, it's not our formal process that we will be doing later on, but we wanted to make sure that we utilized and recognized the um, community results and definitions that the commission recently finalized. And then the second part of this workshop will really be commission discussion. It's a lot of information that we've shared and we'll talk about, um, par particularly the kind of our review of funding recommendations. So we wanna make sure that a, this is interactive. So thank you very much, Sarah. So just advancing, what you're seeing right now is the actual award amount for the city of Battle Creek. So in the, our, we call it ARPA, um, the city was awarded $30,545,339. That was a direct allocation to the city of which we have received the first um, one half payment um, into the, the city accounts. And we expect to receive the second half payment in uh, calendar year 2022, probably about May, which was the same time we, we received this. I was thinking that by this time we would be sharing with you a final rule, but we still are, um, as far as treasury guidance, we're still in an interim final rule. Um, and if any of you have had a chance to look at that, it's, it's very robust, uh, several pages, I think near 80, um, and it's still interim. So um, there still, still could be some changes by treasury, by US treasury, um, and we'll, we'll have to adjust if, if we need to, although I do believe they've gone pretty far down um, and I don't expect any big changes. I, I will be honest, one of the changes that we would like to see um, is the use of fiscal year in, in making some of the calculations that are required in the act. Um, because they're using, they're not using a fiscal year, they're using a December 31st date which for the city of Battle Creek isn't the most helpful with a June 30 fiscal end. So we're having to make kind of mid fiscal year calculations to meet treasuries, you know, their guidance. So we're, we're hoping that perhaps one of the changes in the interim final rule might be that we could make calculations by fiscal year. But as of right now, we've had to make our calculations and Linda will talk about that um, based on the rule that's in play right now. And that is a December 31st. So, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole rule. I think the most important thing for um, our neighbors to know in the community and for all of you to know is in order to use ARPA funds, um, we have to fit that activity project service program into one of the four buckets. Um, and we, we have indicated those. So it has to either be in the negative, negative economic impact bucket. Um, a premium pay for eligible workers, government services lost revenue, and water, sewer, and broadband. Uh, the act is very clear that any funds expended from ARPA need to be in one of these four buckets. So you'll see as we talk through some of the recommended um, projects and activities that we have placed those in what we feel is the appropriate ARPA bucket and um, in thus meeting the rule. Next slide, please. So next, um, the, the act 
um, you know, we talk a lot about what a tremendous opportunity this is for the city, um, but then we have to stop and pause and remember the reason why we have this opportunity is because we've all been faced with, you know, a serious set of consequences based on a global pandemic. And what that and recognition that that has certainly caused um, negative impacts for a lot of municipal budgets, if not all municipal budgets. So one of the very big and most important components of the act is that any municipality receiving ARPA funds has to do a revenue loss calculation, because first and foremost, ARPA dollars need to be used, you know, um, for those impacted by COVID and particularly to fill budget holes that COVID has created. And certainly we know that COVID has created um, budget gaps for the city that we that we've ex are experiencing already. So I'm going to turn it over to Linda and she's going to talk about, you know, how and how we made the revenue loss calculation for the city according to the act. Linda. Thank you, Rebecca. And as Rebecca mentioned, some of the timing of gathering the data for this is at a period end that is not our fiscal year end. And that has caused not only the city of Battle Creek some angst, but a lot of organizations across the United States. And um, we're still hoping that that interim rule as it transitions into a final rule will change that. But as she also mentioned, our first reporting was due today and the data on this worksheet um, had to be submitted to Treasury. So we had to use the interim rules. Um, but for, for this calculation, the Government Finance Officers Association created a calculator. And a lot of guidance um, from the interim rule was incorporated into a multi-tab Excel document to pull this information um, together. I entered a lot of details. Um, some revenue sources are included, some are not. No federal sources are included to come to this base year revenue that's shown there at the top. Our base year revenue period is for the period ending 63019. That's the last full fiscal year we had before COVID. And then the calculation compares it to a 12 month period ending. 1231 of 20. And so in that middle section, that estimated revenue or base year revenue, which is the 12 months ending 63019, which was audited, $97,191,150. The calculator takes an assumption that those, that year's revenue would grow 4.1% every year and then compares it to our actual 12 month revenue of as of 1231 to 20, that's the 95,965, 585. But the growth of the, that base year revenue would be 103,229,260. The difference between those two numbers is what we get to use for general governmental services as um, to the extent of lost revenue, 7,261,675. So really what it's doing is looking at a period of time and it's saying with all those revenues growing at 4.1% per year, what would be your revenue for the 12 months ending 1231-20? And we can show that um, the actual revenue that we got in is seven point, almost $7.3 million less. So there's one of the buckets that was shown on the previous, previous slide um, that we have um, put each one of the, the suggested and recommended projects into. Does anyone have any questions about that? It's, it was a very time consuming process. Um, we had a finance team look it over together um, to try to find the best way to <laughs> use the data and be as accurate as possible because this will be audited, not in the fiscal year that will be audited starting in October, but next year at about this time, because this is a very, a very critical piece of the ARPA funding. Any questions? Okay, 
I actually have a question, Ms. Morrison. Sure. So um, I know you were talking about the calculation of the growth rate. What would you say has been our historical growth rate? Have we seen that? Were we expecting to have a 4.1? Because I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I thought we were expecting a reduction anyways, but. This is, uh, this is the suggested growth rate for the calculation that came from Treasury. So that is the growth weight that is included in the calculator. Um, I agree, some revenue sources would have dropped as like we've seen in the income tax revenues, but also some, you know, there are built-in rate increases for water and sewer, those kinds of things. And so I think Treasury was trying to find kind of a middle ground considering inflation, which has been very low. Um, and you and came upon the 4.1 percent. Okay, so if so, we're using their estimated growth rate for the calculation, right. not necessarily what right. we had budgeted as our potential growth rate. Correct. Correct. Interesting. And just out of curiosity, what did we expect our potential growth rate to be um, for for this time frame? I'd have to look, but I can get back to you um, sure. again. Each revenue source is going to be different. And again, in that base year revenue, that $97 million number mm -hmm. is not every revenue source that the city has. Um, the interim rule picks out certain revenue sources. And so it would take you know, some calculating to do, but I certainly can do that and let you know what that number would be. Sure, I absolutely, I know you always get back to me. Thank you for answering that. Sure. It's, a, it's a good question too, Commissioner Blood, mm -hmm. if I might add, um, because, you know, we have to kind of subscribe to what the interim rule says, and it may, it may not be, and in several places, it's not an apples to apples comparison to Battle Creek. And that, that's the frustrating part is that we, you know, we're trying to, in some instances, put a, a square peg into a round hole, because that's the guidance that the federal government has, has given us, um, as they try to do something as uniform as possible for every municipality in the United States that received the funds. So I, I appreciate you pointing that out because no, it would vary by our funds. Um, and really we're just, uh, we're, we're just doing what the federal government asked us to do. But I appreciate that because I want people to understand you're right, our growth rate. It, I mean, I think even if we took an average would not be 4.1% for a variety of reasons. Um, and you know, we're just starting to see small growth in taxable value. So if you just looked at that, um, it, you know, it would, it wouldn't be 4.1%. So thank you very much. That was a great question. Commissioners, if, if you have any questions as we go through this, feel free to ask. It's hard for me to see everyone. And even with the um, participant list up, it's hard for me to see everyone. So just speak up if you do have questions. Otherwise, um, just hold them until the end when we have um, commissioner comment. Thank you. Great. Um, <clears throat> Linda, I was wondering, are we locked into that seven, is it seven point two million? Um, yeah. So Rebecca said we've got three years. Is it three years to expend? Three years to encumber. Five years to expend. Okay. So, like, I'm guessing the income tax will continue to be less because people are continuing to work from home. So if they're not living in the city, so, I mean, this could have, um, this could have kind of long-term repercussions for that line item of revenue. So are we going to say that that 7.2 million is kind of it for the lost revenue bucket? Or, I mean, is this, does this change year over year? We will have to do this calculation again and look at different points in time to see how it changes. So I think the next calculation date will be 1231 of 21, unless um, the final rule changes it to be a fiscal year end. So we'll have to look at the 12 month period again. So this is, this is what we have for right now with the data that we have right now, but there are different check-in points. 
Thank you, Commissioner Sophia. Another really good question that's in our notes and you just brought it right out. So that's good. You're right because um, things change and you are right. We're just seeing the very early stages of what income tax could look like. But then remember, as we talked about kind of the impact of COVID and as you mentioned, Commissioner Sophia, is that um, we have a lot of employers that are still allowing teleworking and that may be a permanent change. And so then that could impact our office and commercial spaces all, all over the city. Uh, and so that, that again would be kind of a lagging indicator that you know, we hope that within the time that we can recalculate our revenue loss that um, you know, we could make an adjustment for that. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Linda, did you have anything else or can we move to the next page? Okay. Um, move on, yep. Thank you, Sarah, appreciate that. So um, a lot of things to talk about, and I, you know, I'll probably do a screen share or Sarah, if you could bring up the Excel worksheets, I'll come back to that in just a minute. But just as an overall, um, whoops. Yeah, stay right there for just a second. Thanks, Sarah. Um, overall, you know, you just saw that we, we received about $30.545 million in ARPA. Um, but we had in between uh, staff and community partners, we had a total project request of a, over $154 million. So you can see while $30 million is a tremendous opportunity, we still have a great amount of need. Um, and so trying to um, to balance those projects to what, you know, our community priorities are. Remembering first and foremost, it's to fill the hole that COVID has created in the city's budget. And then to do what we can to, um, to assist those most impacted by COVID, whether they be our, our own neighbors or businesses or, or any fields related. So um, what we wanted to make sure that we gave you kind of a snapshot. So total projects submitted was 185 projects at a little over 154 million. Um, so as we try to place projects um, or activity services into the ARPA buckets, um, we just had we had way more need than dollars that we had. So some, you know, we had to make some really important decisions. One, I told you we talked about fiscal sustainability. Um, we utilized uh, certainly the lost revenue calculation, but then also the priority based budgeting community results and definitions, making sure that any project that was going to be recommended for funding consideration fit into one of the four ARPA buckets and could also um, demonstrate its, its support towards our community results um, and definitions, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But in the course of kind of looking through um, all of the projects and needs of the city over the next three and three to five years, uh, there were some projects that while um, we didn't necessarily thought or could fit it into an ARPA bucket, um, it still was a, was a priority for the city. And so we have other funds that we could utilize. So we wanted to make sure that what the commission saw was projects that have been um, that will be funded using our internal risk fund versus using ARPA dollars or kind of using that 7.2 loss revenue calculation. Um, again, really important projects, but we're trying to leverage the, the ARPA dollars to the best of our ability to, you know, to kind of make them go farther. So if there was potentially another fund that we could utilize, then um, we sought to do so. So we wanted to make sure that, well, you know, these are on that list of 185 projects, we've identified and moved them into the risk fund for funding, either in this current fiscal year or subsequent fiscal years. Um, so that, you know, that included some work that's ongoing, uh, the equity audit, it includes a lobbyist contract that we partner with the Community Foundation. It's uh, clearing of parcels around the Kmart site that we have some security concerns with. Uh, smart cameras, SCBAs for the fire department, um, air, filtration, Im air filtration improvements, um, roof replacements for station three and four, fire stations three and four, and then body-worn cameras to complete the body-worn camera purchases um, at the police department. So again, what we've tried to do at, from a staff perspective is leverage um, all the funds that we have at our disposal, including the ARPA dollars to get as many projects to a funding position um, that we could. Uh, Commissioner Blood, I think I saw your hand. I just wanted to clarify um, and make sure I understood what you were saying, because when I was reading this presentation, thank you for sending it to us prior um, so we could have a look at it. 
uh, I was understanding the risk fund was one of those backfilled with the 7.2. But what I'm hearing you say is the risk fund is not a backfill. These are projects that were submitted in the 185 and didn't quite meet the bucket. So, but they were so important that we funded them um, out of another source, but we're not backfilling them with ARPA funds. That is correct. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. I saw Miss Morrison going, yes. <laughs> so thank you. I just wanted to make sure I heard that correct because it wasn't clear in the presentation when we were reading it. And so I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, some of the things that are in our staff recommendations, we, we've highlighted a few, um, golf irrigation and excavator truck and Davis weather stations, you know, we, they were not funded. I mean, because there's just so much, we have a lot of need in a full service city our size. Um, so again, we tried to prioritize um, to the best of our ability. Let me see what the next. Rebecca? Is. Yes. Sorry. Sorry, I can't see everybody either. Oh, no. So thank you. Just go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Blood, for that question, because it was really helpful for me as well. I am um, going to ask what SCBA stands for, because I don't know. I'm sure there's others that don't either. Oh, my gosh. I um, Chief Sturdivant might have to tell. It's self-contained breathing, breathing apparatus. apparatus. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I knew it would come to me, but um, yes, self-contained breathing apparatus. Very important to the fire department, <laughs> you know, if, if, if anything. And, and so, again... Uh, the, even projects that weren't funded either out of risk or ARPA, it's not that they're not important. We will attempt to then, you know, we'll continue to work through the capital improvement program and watch our budget, you know, our budget and capital needs to see at what point things can be funded. Um, okay. Rebecca, Rebecca, before you move on. Yes, um, <laughs> I heard two you, voices. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, could you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by smart cameras? Sure. Um, so smart cameras can be, uh, for example, we're looking at one at City Hall, and they can actually um, live, they can give you live views of certain areas. For example, if, if we've had some places where people are dumping trash, we can deploy a smart camera, and it it very highly tech and, and Sarah Van Warmer may be able to describe this way better than I can because I am not a techie. Um, but they're very high resolution, high technology cameras that can help with live situations um, in real time. Um, but also Chief Blacker, uh, if you'd like to, it, because I know that the police department is gonna be utilizing these as well in like parking ramps and areas of concern. Yeah, what, one reason why we hope to use them is um, again, these are smart cameras versus a normal security camera. So not only can you set where you want it to focus and aim at, you can also set what it's looking for in terms of movement. Let's say in a downtown parking garage, we can say, hey, we really want you between, um, let, let's say at hours of darkness, 8 p.m. at night until 6 a.m. in the morning, we want you to be able to focus on this area. And if there's a figure that is moving among the cars for let's say over a minute, it'll immediately turn on and start recording but it will also then notify us, and let us know that, hey, someone is loitering in this particular area and that will notify us. And what that really does is it cuts down on the recording time and the, and the server space time. And, and, and frankly, it's probably one of the better technological play, uh, replacements for a person to sit there and watch over these areas. And so we're pretty excited about this program as, it, as we continue to see what these cameras are capable of. Are there any other questions? And nope, Sarah, sounds, do you have anything? Sounds really cool. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Thank you. I thought I thought it was cool too when I figured it out. Thanks. I, I heard another voice. Um, it's Vice Mayor Ferris, and now I've got more questions. <laughs> are, are the cameras? Do they have two-way communication? Uh, I think I understand uh, two-way meaning. Um, hey, Sarah. They can communicate can, can to us, and we can see them. Okay. But I don't know. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's we not can like see the camera the... will say anything to the area that it's that it's looking at, if that's what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, that was what I was wondering if you could communicate to the person you see on camera. Yeah. So picture yourself, your patrol officer. Um, and let's say you've just got a buzz on your your smartphone and you look down and it, it says, Hey, this is camera six. You know where camera six is because it's your your beat. 
and he said, hey, I'm in, I'm recording right now. So, you know, you've got to move over there and at least call someone and say, hey, I've got movement. And it's beyond our rules that we set. So it's not just someone walking to their car. It's someone that's actually loitering. So again, we're going to, we're getting moving into a, a test and experiment phase, but in other communities that have done, had this program implemented, uh, departments are really appreciating them. And so is the community, obviously. Great, thank you. And then my other question was for you, Rebecca. On the slide that we're looking at right now, I just wanted to make sure that I understood the three projects that are listed to the left are not being funded by Risk Fund. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Because again, I can't see Todd or Ted. Uh, Rebecca, I thought I would just clarify quickly too. The three projects that you see on the left are just random projects from the broader list of 185. So they were just somewhat randomly selected from that from that uh, particular list. They happen to be projects that aren't in our final recommendation, but they were randomly selected from the list. Great, thanks. So. Um, I'll go through, I mean, we can go through individual projects if you'd like. I want to utilize the time of our partners really good. So if you could switch to the next um, slide, Sarah. Don't go to the, the Excel. Yes, thank you. And we'll come back to that what, what, with what time we have. So one of the things that we highlighted um, in the documents that the commission received was um, we called them priority projects because they're projects that are moving relatively quickly um, and will need to come forward to commission for consideration. And I think I should clarify that too. Um, tonight, we're not really asking for approvals. That has to be done very formally by resolution, um, either by a specific project or as part of a budget amendment. Um, and so we anticipate those projects that we're going to talk about next, the priority projects moving relatively quickly into, into the commission agenda for approval. Um, and so what we have here, we have um, five projects and I'm going, to, uh, turn, I'm going to turn it over to our community partners. We're going to let Joe Soborowski go first um, and he's going to talk about the McCamley Plaza um, and hotel project. Then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nakia Bayless to talk about the catalyzing community giving. Um, and then um, I'll probably turn it over to Alyssa Stewart from the United Way to talk about the United Way disaster relief and our United Way funds. And then the last two, Dolliver and Hotel Motel, Ted's going to talk about. So um, Sarah, if you would please allow Joel Soborowski to share screen, I'm going to give him his time to talk about the McCamley Plaza Hotel and our recommendation to provide $2.5 million of ARPA funds to that project. Thank you. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. All right, let me just get to my views section. Okay. Uh, thank you all. It's, it's great to be here. I think it's been nearly two years since I've actually presented in front of the city commission. So um, it's, it's, it's exciting to be back um, and, and thank you for your time. I'll, I'll try to briefly go through this. If anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to stop me at any time. Just to hear at the beginning, I wanted to do a little um, background of what the hotel is. It's a 15 story, 239 room, 180,000 square foot facility. It was built in 1981. Um, and it's really not had any significant upgrades since the day uh, it was built. Uh, unit two, uh, which is what we're calling part of the hotel complex, is the mall plaza portion that is a two-story building compromising about 85,000 square feet, um, direct built pretty much after the hotel connecting the arena and the hotel. Uh, so total combined square footage, 265,000 square feet um, and a little less than uh, four acres. Just to give you an idea of the current state of the facility, um, you know, as, uh, as I had mentioned, this facility has gone through multiple hands over the years. And, and really it seems like um, folks run it for a little while, um, realize that it needs uh, some significant upgrades and then it gets passed on. And uh, I know Rebecca and I and Ted and, and many others have been working on this project for well over five years, um, how we came into control of the facility was through the DIF fund. Uh, we lent dollars to a developer um, who was going to upgrade it to a Doubletree hotel. Um, that did not happen. 
um, and we came into ownership of the hotel uh, via legal proceedings. We've been working, we, we took ownership of the hotel last uh, September, uh, excuse me, last November. And we've been working with uh, engineers and design firms on you know, what, what really is gonna make, take to get this project up to um, the potential that we think this community needs and deserves and will contribute uh, economically uh, to the community. So I just wanted to point out, these are some, just some conceptual renderings. Uh, we are playing with ideas of staining the brick to change the color, uh, putting on um, some what they'll call metal panels, and even doing some exterior illumination at night, which is a priority of ours. You know, the, the one down here in the corner could go, it's showing blue, um, but that's, uh, we would like to install something that could change. So uh, during 4th of July, you could do red, white, and blue. Um, other months uh, that are themed, um, you could change during Christmas, uh, red and green. Uh, let's just give you an idea of what it could look like. Um, during this process, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about this on the next couple slides, um, we worked with a, a philanthropic partner. Um, we brought them to the table uh, to, bring, to bring some funding to bring this hotel uh, up, to, up to speed. And uh, during discussions, you know, we really talked about the old mall and plaza portion that has significantly de deteriorated as well. Um, so we worked with the a philanthropic foundation and uh, we are set to acquire that facility. Um, th really the message was, uh, we believe in this project for Battle Creek, but we don't want to trip over ourselves and not have a piece of the complete complex between the arena and the hotel um, because they all really um, jive with one another, one another uh, including the parking ramp, which is important to the hotel as well. Um, and then and then looking into with engineers, the renovation cost of unit two, um, this is not set in stone yet, but um, it was not economically feasible to buy unit two and renovate an 85,000 square feet, basically empty mall. Now there is some use there, but um, it, would, it would cost a lot more and you would have no guaranteed revenue um, of any commercial tenants. So what we try to do is conceptualize an area that would uh, give a proper entrance to the arena, uh, connect the hotel, um, and, and add some amenities to the hotel and actually create some, some outdoor space uh, in, in the middle of downtown. So some of the imagery that you're seeing there would be what could potentially replace unit two. Okay. Um, just to give you an idea of the numbers, the estimated total cost of this project is nearly $60 million, 59200000 the hotel alone is 46 million. Uh, unit two is 12 million. Both of those include some land costs, uh, professional engineering services. So they're not the actual raw construction costs. Um, BCU to date has invested approximately $4 million into this. Um, and really this kind of leads into um, ARPA qualifications. Uh, I, I talk about this a lot. Battle Creek is a market in transition. Um, the hotel may cost 46 million, but your appraisal is gonna come in at 20 million and it really creates a gap. Um, so we're overturning every single program that we can from the MEDC to philanthropic partners to close that. Um, we are gonna order another appraisal. We believe the hotel industry has improved slightly to where that appraisal might go up a little bit. Um, hotel occupancy from what I understand in Calhoun County is one of the highest in the state. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, so our needed equity stake is nearly uh, 20, $29 million. Um, we have leveraged, uh, made lots of ask, and we have leveraged many, many, many community partners. Um, you can see the list there of the community partners um, who have already contributed and the ones who have been asked that are, are in the process of, of considering. Oops. Uh, just kind of give you an idea of the economic impact numbers. Uh, these are annual numbers. Um, 163 operational jobs once fully stabilized, and I put a caveat there that's pre-COVID. Um, the, the hotel industry, just like everybody else, is struggling to hire. Um, some of these hotel operations are finding that uh, rooms are no longer needing to be cleaned on a daily basis because of guests are, are requesting that nobody enter their room. So um, it could be a situation where it's 80% it's of that number, um, but we're going to have to see how the the recovery of COVID uh, continues. Uh, on your right is your visitor expenditures. You know, just retail alone, we feel that this is uh, directly related to 
pushing out uh, uh, um, um, room night stay uh, guests out into the downtown and spending their dollars here at the local restaurants. Um, the construction trades there, that's the, the economic output and the tax impact. So in 2023, um, it would reach uh, uh, 713,000. That's inclusive of the, the city's tax as well as the CBB. So it reaches uh, 1 million in 2028, 2029. Um, what's unique about this is we plan to work with our community partners, uh, our local schools, uh, KCC, Grand Valley State University, which has a partnership with the Kellogg Foundation, um, to create a teaching hotel concept to expose our youth uh, and our residents to really a really upward mobility industry. Uh, you, you start in on the ground floor, um, but there's a lot of upward mobility in the hospitality industry. So that's a, that's a unique aspect of this project. Um, the timeline, uh, just to give you an idea, the hard bids uh, for phase one is complete. General contractor identified, hotel operator. Uh, we've received the flag from the Hilton, um, uh, Doubletree by Hilton. Uh, we plan to start uh, phase one construction, which is a lot of the mechanical stuff that has a lot of lead time. Um, and we're also trying to hedge uh, for some cost increases with materials. Um, we plan to close on unit two and Q3. Uh, we have approached the MEDC in the state. Uh, that application is in. Um, we hope to have our, our capital stack finalized uh, the, in Q3 or Q4 of this year, and it would be operational. Um, probably it's leaking into, into the first quarter of 2023. Um, just wanted to throw some things together for some consideration, how this qualifies for ARPA. Um, I won't read the whole list. Um, Rebecca can, uh, if I send this to you, you can provide this to the commissioners. Yes, um, yep, and I just really wanted to um, point out that we're really blessed um, to, to even be this far in the conversation, but um, thus far, um, we would need to leverage an additional 26.5 uh, million. And I can tell you at this point, we have uh, $21.5 million committed from our philanthropic partners. And they are also willing to guarantee the uh, senior debt position on the loan because banks are hesitant to, to loan on uh, the hospitality industry right now. So um, with that, I, I'll stop. I have a, I have a question. Okay. Um, this is Commissioner Herring. So if I'm understanding correctly, this is a loan from the city? No. Well, this, would, this would be a grant. Oh, sorry. This is Rebecca's. Sorry. That's okay. It would be a grant. Okay. Um, I need to end my show. Is it okay to end my slideshow? Sure. We can put this, Joe, we'll put your presentation up when we put our information out with all of this information, our presentation and the spreadsheets and et cetera. I think it was Commissioner Reynolds and I see Commissioner Morris. So I hope yes. I'm getting it in the right order. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, Joe. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Great presentation. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. My question was, now you say you had an application in the state. Do you have any type of um, ideas to what we might be looking at? with those applications out there? So the request to the MEDC is mm -hmm. a combination of grant and loan totaling 9 oh. million. Okay. Um, the state is working on a supplemental uh, $2.1 million package that has some ARPA match uh, so that, that 9 million may alter between the two. Okay. Um, and they are looking, from what I understand those buckets, they are looking to leverage local communities on their ARPA dollars as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Commissioner Morris? Nope. Yep. Oh, yeah. Hi. Sorry. Um, the, my question is for Joe, too. So if we were to go ahead with this and um, use these funds, do you have anything in place to monitor and make sure that it doesn't end up how it is right now? Yeah, that's, um, that's the uniqueness of this. Um, so this would be a, uh, an asset owned uh, by Battle Creek Unlimited with a separate organization that would have a, would, would have a board. Um, our intent is not to turn this back over to the private sector and let it, um, I guess, deteriorate, let's say in year 10. Um, the performa and everything has dollars set aside on an annual basis so that in year five or seven, when there needs to be a $4 million refresh, 
you have the money sitting there and, and um, we really intend to, um, if it's, it's gonna break even or be profitable, we hope it becomes really profitable, but really funnel the dollars back into the economic development ecosystem in, in Battle Creek. So circulating the dollars here locally. Thank you. Commissioner Zenda Wilson, I see your hand and I think Commissioner Herring after that, okay. Thank you very much. Joe, thanks for this, it's helpful. I'm actually really inspired by the innovative, innovative approach for a teaching hotel. That's, uh, you know, I like that, that concept a lot. I do have a question about, um, you know, projected revenue from the hotel so that we can create a sustainable model is going to be um, heavily dependent on some real synergy across our economic development efforts to make sure that we're driving people to Battle Creek and who yep. want to spend their time here. And so I'm wondering, you know, how much effort is being placed in that to lay some foundation for those things. I saw some of your partners on the one slide tells me that, that there's some, I'm assuming that there's some efforts there, but can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, um, Commissioner Wilson, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you and that's what's gonna be the driver of this project. Um, I would say 90% of my time right now on this project has been focused with uh, getting the capital stack finalized and getting it under construction, which will then leave us with, it's gonna be at least an 18 month construction project. That's when we're gonna bring in the partners and really create the, what I'll call the, the teaching hotel uh, curriculum, and we'll bring other partners in, uh, including a lot of the businesses in the fort and, and throughout the community to really drive traffic there. Um, if I could add also, you know, the city is, you know, very supportive of, of the hotel becoming a vibrant and working hotel again. Um, but we're also equally interested into its, its relationship and connection to the Kellogg Arena. Um, we know that we, that arena is just an untapped asset. And the more it gets used, um, the more people will come in and want to stay at the hotel. So, you know, of course, it was very crippling during COVID when everything was shut down. We couldn't hold any events in the arena, and we also did not have a functioning working hotel. Um, so that's why, you know, we're so appreciative of Joe and his team, yes, focusing on the hotel, but recognizing that the plaza is, is equally important um, in, in supporting the Kellogg Arena because we just see that advancing, the availability of a large space just, just for sport events that have contacted us um, and um, social service groups and clubs who want to come and do annual events. I, we only see that increasing um, because the hotel is a draw for the arena and the arena is a draw for the hotel. So, you know, it's, it's a symbiotic relationship that we want to continue to nurture. Um, and I know that, that Ted and the CVB and CCDC are all very focused on making sure we're marketing the arena appropriately in conjunction with all of the great work that is happening with the hotel and other downtown um, partners. Thank you, Rebecca. That was my follow-up question. And I also think about when I moved here in the early 90s, there was such a thriving downtown and so much was happening at Bailey Park and, and other places that were sports related that drew families here. So I think that there is, and now we've got HandMap and, and the record box that are doing weddings. So I just think this idea of private public, plus looking at all of the players and making sure that we are working together to, to really kind of highlight downtown because you're also competing with all the stuff out here at 94 and the new hotels that are out there. So thank you. Yes, thank you. I think it was Commissioner Herring. Thank you, Rebecca. So I just have a question. Is there any um, thought to using local contractors? Yes, um, we've in phase one, um, we have bid that portion out. And I will say, um, I'm just making up a number here, but I would say there's, there's six major uh, contractors on that project. Um, there is a GM that oversees those, but of the six, I would say at least three of them are local. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Joe? Could you remind me, what was the total ask from the city? 2.5 million in ARPA funds um, going to both the hotel and the plaza. 1.5 to the hotel and one to the plaza. Thank you. I do have a question. Um, Joe, 
towards the latter part of the um, organization at McCambie Plaza, it seemed like there wasn't an attraction or there wasn't a draw except for maybe some weddings, um, some events at Kellogg Arena. How are you going to write your business plan to really make an attraction that's going to bring people in that um, hadn't been there beforehand in order to really make this thing successful? I know that you and I have talked about a couple of things, but are we getting closer to that attraction that's really going to make that a magnet? And then secondly, um, I really feel that the city of Battle Creek needs to have a seat on your corporate board um, for this uh, contribution that we're making on behalf of the uh, people of our community. That, that, is, that is noted. And uh, to give a little bit, I think it, it goes back to Commissioner Zendo Wilson as bringing the community together to make sure that this hotel is, is successful. I can say um, even as uh, early as 2017, 2018, um, this hotel was hitting nearly 60% occupancy. Um, and, and that's what uh, per COVID and, and, and probably really, really rough shape. I can tell you, I probably wouldn't stay there knowing how many times I've been in that facility now over the last year. Um, I think the real key to the hotel is having a product that people are proud and, and comfortable in staying in. That's where it really started to wean uh, without the uh, proper investment, but absolutely pulling the partners in, um, having additional events at the arena um, are key to, to getting it over that 60% occupancy. And I'm confident that can happen. Thanks. Any other? I do, Rebecca. Oh, thank you. Yes, Commissioner. Um, Joe, I was just wondering, with our other um, hotels around the area, those that are specifically branded, name brand, not um, somewhat privately owned, what are our occupancy rates there? And what do we um, know those revenue streams to, to be? Have they been on the incline? Because I haven't um, I haven't seen the same statistics you have that the ho hotel industry yet is fully recovering. So I'm wondering what those hotel rates are at, because I know we've still been hosting a few things and maybe what that revenue has looked like. And I, I, don't, we, I, I don't have it with me right now, but I can work with the CDB uh, to get their numbers. They, they have probably the most real time. Um, those numbers are probably going to be reflected in our updated appraisal. So um, we've worked with CBRE, which is my number two in the nation, uh, and they ran all those numbers back in uh, January. So those numbers are going to be quite interesting to compare after three solid months of, of, of hotel occupancy. But I, I will work to get that for you. I think that Rebecca temporarily lost the connection. So are, are there any more, are there any more questions for Joe? I, I, I have one, Ted, this is a yeah. commission cool. plans. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know when Rebecca's going to get back, but Joe, I think it, it, it kind of goes to what has been being asked about um, the use of this uh, hotel and the attraction that it, that it is, I guess, I think the arena has been mentioned several times and I know that, at least in this projected uh, first ask for, for ARPA dollars, uh, the arena doesn't have any, um, I didn't see anything from staff regarding arena dollars to upgrade that, also to make it an attraction. So, I mean, I guess if we update the, 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 the hotel, I don't know if there's any plans to, uh, to also upgrade the, and, and the, the arena to make it more attractive. I don't know if you've had those discussions with Rebecca and Ted or not. Been able to help that a little bit too, and so a, a couple of things. Since we live in such a connected world, um, I believe that Linda Freibler, who was the head of the CVP, is actually watching and listening to this presentation. And she simply texted me real quick and said, "Over 80 to 95 percent for branded hotels." So I think occupancy rate at our branded hotels does quite well in our community. And of course, a lot of the amateur sports activity that we have in the summertime books those hotels at 100 percent of the weekend. So I, I wanted to share that information, and then. The arena, that's a great question, Commissioner. Um, there, there are actually some, uh, there were several items that were actually in the recommended list, or the larger list um, pertaining to the arena. There, I think there may have only been one or two that we actually recommended for funding. Although we do have some other sources of funding that we can pursue 
for renovations at the arena. Now, I will point out that the arena did go through a fairly major renovation in 2015 and 16. Um, that was a, you know, a pretty significant overhaul of most of uh, the interior of the building. And so I'm not suggesting that there aren't additional needs there and that we won't continue to look at those. Uh, but I think as far as the, the physical facility, the arena is not in bad shape. We need to add some of the amenities like sports court and some other things that drive ad, event activity there. But it is definitely on our radar to, to coincide with what's happening here at the hotel for improvements. Thanks. A any other questions for Joe? Okay, I'm not hearing any. So we'll move on to uh, catalyzing community giving. I know Dr. Bayless is here. Sounds like Will Fobbs is here. Um, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Bayless, if I can. I'll let you lead the, the uh, discussion around uh, CCG. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having us today, everyone. Happy to be here and share with you a little bit about the Catalyzing Community Giving Village Reemergence Plan project. Um, we have requested funding to be used to build, acquire, and renovate vacant community buildings and predominantly BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color neighborhoods for BIPOC Ellis, Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. I know you guys enjoy hearing that, ter that, that terminology. We love our, our, our acronyms over at United Way. <laughs> Um, but we're looking to uh, support BIPOC Alice residents in Battle Creek uh, around entrepreneurial incubation, workforce training support, um, economic barrier removal services, soft skills training, and uh, financial education support that intentionally complement uh, the work of our workforce development partners, our corporate partners, and United Way Alice Initiative. Now, this, this investment will also uh, support some data sharing dashboards uh, and, and partner dashboard integrations as a mechanism for community-wide data collection, synthesis, and analysis so that we can look forward to more rapid and reliable decision-making around our investments that are ma being made into our community's current and future workforce development efforts. Uh, this investment will be used to leverage additional philanthropic investments to secure full implementation of the village ecosystems and continue supporting successful uh, community outcomes with a focus on community economic development that increases the number of residents that participate in our local economy, economy ultimately increasing our local GDP. Um, one thing that we, we realize and, and acknowledge is that the conditions and assets in our community actually provide us an opportunity uh, to create a model with tools and frameworks that can be scaled to other communities. And just kind of thinking about that data, um, the, the project develops kind of a best practice model that's grounded in data used uh, statewide and uh, promotes uh, increased participation again, in our local and state economies. And when we look at our Alice data, Calhoun County actually has very similar statistics uh, for BIPOC Alice as the state. So given the potential $97.9 billion increase to Michigan's GDP gross domestic product, if every household were above the Alice threshold, this project actually allows us to bring this to scale in our city that we can also support uh, at a statewide level uh, as we share across our United Way networks. Um, now, we do that by uh, basically building ecosystems that increase the number of sustainable jobs, uh, improves the quality of existing jobs, and improves, improves labor market labor outcomes for workers by applying cost benefit analysis and social rate of return. So moreover, um, the project really creates and increases the number of small businesses within BIPOC neighborhoods at or below the Alice threshold. Um, and, and we're looking at even a modest increase in that number um, created by existing uh, small business secures employment opportunities for the un or underemployed residents in our most marginalized communities. 
Um, now with that, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Will Fobbs, our ecosystem designer, uh, who is really working hand and very, very closely with uh, our community leaders, uh, our BIPOC leaders uh, that, that are leading in each of the many villages. And we do recognize the village, by the way, as being the entire city of Battle Creek, a network of our BIPOC uh, residents and leaders, um, again, creating systems that are designed by and for uh, them to, to promote, uh, again, economic, economic development. Um, so with that, I, I'd like to turn it over to Will to speak a little bit more about that. And um, can I share my screen? Would it be possible for me to share my screen? You should be all set to go ahead and share. All righty. Okay, are you all seeing learning about uh, growing food indoors? Perfect. Okay, Will, I'll turn it over to you to speak a bit and, and then we can go into some questions. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, those of you uh, that have met me know that I'm fairly excitable and I'm excited about all the things that are happening within Battle Creek and uh, communities of color. Um, we actually had uh, some slides to kind of show you um, uh, kind of behind the scenes of what's happening in the community because yes, it's about the leaders and the cohort within uh, catalyzing community giving, but really it's about the residents. Um, it's about the youth. It's about our future. It's about reimagining um, and reemerging successfully. And so here uh, we actually have Jose and uh, actually uh, uh, youth and, and, and folks from the community visiting um, the Potawatomi and their greenhouse, uh, learning uh, from our partners, learning of different ways to reimagine food and our food ecosystem. You know, when we think about economic development, um, for us, it's actually bigger than even just structures. Yes, that's a part of it, but really it's about our mindset and reimagining what that can look like. And, you know, as I start to think about what I was gonna say, uh, as I present to the commission, commissioners and everyone on this call, you know, I started to think about, you know, all the different areas and cross sections um, that are important to the work, um, whether that's actually helping to create careers as Nakia was highlighting, uh, workforce development training, uh, in culturally relevant spaces and places. Um, or sometimes in this picture, this is actually uh, Pastor Bailey, who is actually what we call our elder statesman. And he was basically uh, uh, highlighting what happened at a gasoline station several months. Um, and, and he was saying, you know what, we've got to actually say this is not okay. He was really looking at our culture. Yes, culture in, the, in Washington Heights. Yes, culture uh, in an area predominantly uh, with predominant African-American residents but also the culture of our city. How can we come together? How can we join hands and say, we're going to solve this together? And yes, it's gonna be bumpy sometimes and, and, and whatnot, but we actually are going to be very intentional about not giving up. And that's one thing that COVID has, I think, uh, highlighted for, at least for me, is that as a country, we're actually learning how to figure this out and almost learn how to share and work together as one. And so uh, the 846 uh, in, that he had in the sign, um, that would actually represent a group of the community that are saying, um, we actually really wanna make sure that our culture not only is preserved, but thrives for our young people um, and those what I call our elder statesmen. The slide uh, here is actually uh, one of the folks that uh, is behind the scenes doing a great job uh, working with us. Um, and there's so many different uh, folks that, um, may not actually be in all the meetings, may not actually, uh, we see them, but they're very important to the work. And I wanted to highlight this because she's actually at the Burma Center where I'm at right now with Mayor Binky, uh, because uh, we actually have uh, a, a ribbon cutting uh, for a project that is actually not part of CCG, but is part of CCG. And I say that because we don't look at uh, individual projects as actually being separate because I consider this a movement. I consider it a movement throughout um, our whole community and region. And so here we were actually giving, uh, there were actually uh, administering uh, vaccine shots for COVID. And so the community came, we actually amplified, we did lots of different convenes, worked, uh, actually it was Grace Health and Bronson uh, working together. And I wanted to highlight that because it's a beautiful partnership of two different um, health systems working together for the greater good. And that's kind of the spirit and principle of what CCG is about. <clears throat> so, sorry guys 
<laughs> I just got a frog in my throat. And <clears throat> sorry, uh, Nikita, why don't you highlight top? Come off mute here. Okay, there we go. <laughs> go ahead. Cough, Will. It's okay. <laughs> It's nice to be able to tag team and have a partner that uh, we work so closely together with this group. And, but just to highlight Todd, you know, Todd has, is, is a leader uh, with the Burma Center. And um, one of the, the opportunities that this work has actually afforded us is to um, support Todd's leadership in, in, in significant ways. Um, we were able to support a full-time salary uh, for Ty. Now we all know, all of y'all know Ty, you know, she's out here working full time anyway, but she was not able to uh, earn a full time salary uh, some time ago. And so this work is actually helping us to build capacity into our uh, BIPOC leadership uh, so that they can expand their reach throughout community and uh, support the systems, the ecosystems that residents are, are sharing with us through community conversations that are really important to them. Um, what we're looking at is, is again, multiple mini, mini villages um, with, with um, trusted BIPOC leadership. Um, and we're looking at building mini villages that have all of the supports that residents indicate that this is what we want and need now. Uh, we look at the, the current needs and we also look at those uh, long-term uh, needs and supports. We do have a 2030 vision of uh, implementation and completion of this work. Um, and realistically, we're looking at a budget in the tens of millions. Uh, right now, again, this work is, is progressive, it's innovative and in in, in, in it's being built by the voice of residents in real time. So um, projections, uh, we have to be very careful of. We are using um, strong data points as we uh, continue to make those projections, but before we publicize them, we definitely want to just be very mindful that we are uh, aligned with what we're hearing residents say. Will, I, it looks like you came back off mute. Are you? I, I'm, I'm back. So yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah sorry about that, guys. Uh, Don't I worry. Just Excited uh, that I had to call. Uh, on the next slide, we actually show a, a gentleman, um, and I wanted to actually have a personal touch where he gave me permission for this, uh, and he actually was uh, not from this country, and was almost in tears because of the opportunity uh, that actually was uh, that transpired at the Burma Center. And I use the Burma Center as a use case because there are infrastructure needs and maintenance needs uh, that exist at the Burma Center. And our heart is to make sure that those actually don't happen so that Ty can actually run quicker, run faster, and continue to do the work that she's doing right now. And that's not just uh, the Burma Center, that's actually uh, at New Level Sports, that's actually with Urban League, and, and on and on throughout the entire cohort. And so it's really important for us to really think about that this is, has a personal touch to us. Yes, there is actually money associated with infrastructure. We understand that. But I always say that that's actually just the tip of the iceberg that we see. A lot of it actually is our culture. A lot of it is our principles. A lot of it's about who we want to be. This picture here is actually uh, the uh, large uh, cohort of the Latino community and uh, the leader of BOSIS, uh, Jose. Uh, and we actually visited uh, Southwestern. <clears throat> and we just imagined. We imagined what we could do uh, in our community to actually catalyze community giving and giving is not always about resources or money. Sometimes it's actually about volunteering. Sometimes it's about bringing your expertise. Sometimes it's just about spreading hope when you actually don't have $2 to rub together. There's lots of ways to catalyze community giving. In fact, from our principal standpoint, in order to catalyze community giving, you have to focus on economics. But if you're gonna focus on economics, you have to focus on education because we have to have a platform and a system that's sustainable for both now and into the long term. And, and then if you're really going to focus on education, you have to start looking at the family and basic needs. Because if, if I'm a child and I'm hungry, it's kind of hard to learn. If, 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 if things are actually messy at home and I'm actually dealing with trauma, it's hard to learn. And so we actually look at things like uh, basic needs. Uh, and Alyssa, I'm trying to give you a handoff. Uh, and, and also looking at where we're going. So we're making a sustainable ecosystem and sustainable ecosystems. And so, um, I guess, uh, Nakia, if you didn't have any other uh, comments, I just wanted to really kind of highlight here uh, 
how we're actually looking at this. We're not looking at this as uh, as something that is is just infrastructure, although it is. We're not looking at this as just a dashboard, although that it is. We're not looking at this just as workforce development, although it is, because we're all interconnected if we kind of look at it that way. We all actually have a part to play and a role to play. And so we look for partnerships uh, all over. Uh, from I call it from the street to the boardroom. And that's really important. We wanna make sure that if we're talking about affordable housing, that the community not only has their voice heard, but is part of actually the planning from get, from get go. We wanna make sure that the community actually uh, can chart their own path alongside with us as true partners at the table. And, and that's really important part of this work. So uh, just an honor to be able to speak uh, to all of you. Uh, it's an honor to be considered for this opportunity. Um, it's an honor to uh, obviously get to planning and get to writing so I can present something, uh, what I call properly, because I didn't know we could present. And so uh, I just thank you. I did this on my phone. I just thank you guys so much. Uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to Nakia. I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca and the team. Do you all have questions or <laughs> feedback thoughts? Happy to answer questions. Yeah, and I just want commissioners, we are at 639 and I, I want to make sure that we keep moving. We've got another community partner. So do we want to ask questions or do we want to hold? That's up to you. Vice Mayor. And now the mayor is back, so I'll defer to him. Um, if we could just take a few minutes. Uh, I'm happy with the leadership um, that we've witnessed so far with the village. And I think that needs to be commended because uh, for a long time, we didn't have the people that were out there speaking. And I think that's re really remarkable. Uh, I know I'm very supportive of everything they're doing and I look forward to partnering with them even more. So let's take a few minutes. I see Commissioner Wilson has her hand up and if anyone else, let's just ch chime in. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, Mayor. As someone who partners often with those the anchor institutions that have been referenced, VOSIS and Urban League and the Burma Center, I can uh, personally attest to how important the need was that they be supported, not just in the ways that we're talking about um, from a capacity building standpoint, but with real dollars, because they are expected to be everywhere all the time and they do so many things. So the idea that um, we can actually compensate them for those things is really critical. And I think that that's putting equity into action. So thank you very much for that. I do want to, um, I, I also want to just shout out to the comprehensive nature of this, that you're actually looking at the intersections in people's lives and making it a multi-generational approach. I think that's really, really commendable. I, um, I want to ask about um, the work being done around childcare as a business, because I know that the Washington Heights area specifically is a childcare desert. And so if that is a focus of yours, if there's a way for you to just at least mention and lift that up so that the other commissioners know what's going on there, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and Kathy, uh, see, uh, I'll speak to that uh, specifically because, uh, like I said, I'm just leaving the Burma Center uh, opening here. Um, and so um, I, I actually also wear another hat helping in terms of capacity with our child care centers, uh, with Mom Perry, uh, with the Burma Center here uh, that I saw Mayor Binky at. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we're doing is making sure that uh, from cradle to career, we're supporting our community. Um, we know that there's a high... Um, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, folks in the community of color uh, within our city, uh, specifically within our pilot region, which was Washington Heights. But now we're actually moving into Meacham and then moving into other neighborhoods. And so we want to make sure that we're supporting our, our child care uh, centers. Why? Because, again, uh, if, if you're not supporting your future, then how do we get off the hamster wheel? How do we actually uh, create our future commissioners and our future mayors? Uh, and, and our future leaders. That, that's very important. It's, it's actually a way of preserving other culture that we know that we have and amplifying it um, and making sure it's sustainable. A lot of times we talk about sustainable of economics. Well, if we actually look at the root, it's actually in our kiddos. And it starts at a young age as, as from a modeling standpoint. So I can say that from a, a, a CCD or catalyzing community standpoint, when I think of education, I'm thinking about zero to career um, all the way through. Um, and, and that's a passion of mine. And, and honestly, that's been a passion that's come through with our leadership uh, and, the, and the leaders that are within uh, CCG. I also think, Kathy, you'll see it um, really highlighted even as we move into the health uh, area. 
um, because it, I think too, we do recognize that it starts at conception, right? Um, and, and taking care of children prenatal and then through development, right? So again, um, really from that cradle to the grave <laughs> uh, concept is really important to us. We do look at a continuum of uh, education and academic readiness and economic readiness. And Nikki, I'll say one thing. One thing uh, a lot of times we focus on childcare, but I will also want to look at our seniors. Um, I was actually just talking to, uh, again, I call them an elder statesman, and I was talking about reimagining and dreaming and, and making sure that our seniors also are able to live in dignity and, be, and play a role in this. So we have these really cool bookends of basically those that are, uh, even before conception, looking and making sure we're doing family support all the way through and then making sure that our seniors also again dignity being able to dream um being able to see basically the transformation that's actually happening before our eyes um and, and honestly passing down their wisdom so we can consistently learn and continuously improve okay commissioner morris i think you had your hand up and then commissioner blood has her hand up thank you mayor oh. um so first i just wanted to say that I have been following the village since I was about 10 years old, <laughs> and I'm proud to see that it's actually coming to fruition. Um, and secondly, I was just wondering, how do we make sure that the resources and the efforts of the village stay within the village? Like, how do we make sure that outside people don't come in and take advantage of the resources and we don't get a part of that? That's a great question. I will say, the, the cohort anchors, the residents, they have the power. They have the power. We, we are, we are in, not in control of this work. We, this work is fully, fully driven by the voice of residents. And we, we're, we're really practicing lifting voice into action. That's what this work is really about, is creating a, a systematic, mechanism for turning voice and aspiration into concrete, sustainable actions. Commissioner, Thank very you. good question. Um, are there any other commission questions at this time? Uh, Vice Mayor Katie Durst. Thank you. Um, the scope of this is so broad and covers so many areas from education, childcare, economic development, small business development, neighborhood development. It, it's so huge. And I realize that these are all real needs in our community. This amount of money seems like a drop in the bucket when it comes to addressing all of that. And so I'm wondering if you could share with us that 2030 vision via email so we can get a better idea of what specific actions will take place to help impact all of these things. Um, it's just because it's so broad, I don't want it to be spread so thin that, that we can't advance on anything. Um, that's always my concern is just spread, spreading financial and, and human resources too thinly, if that makes sense. So any kind of documentation or data that you can share with us would be very helpful to see how this will on unfurl over the next several years. Absolutely. And I'm, glad you, I'm glad you said that, Katie. Uh, we will have a, a, a document. I've actually been working on that. But, so this year was actually technical feasibility. And so one of the reasons why we piloted within Washington Heights is because we're dealing with about 2,800 homes. And we knew that this has to spread in, across our entire city. But we had to actually, if we're going to talk about all these different disparities, we had to actually go small enough in scope to be able to touch all of them but within reason and then actually, again, build capacity to continue the work. And so uh, I actually am uh, landing the plane on said document. So uh, stay tuned, I'll, I'll make sure that you get that in your hands. Um, so you can see different mechanisms and structures and honestly resources uh, that we're actually looking at and actually are, are in play as we speak. Absolutely, and to that point, we, we actually, this is a request as a match to uh, Senate appropriations, a Senate appropriations request that we have in that is advanced at 1.5 million. Uh, we're looking at leverages, uh, philanthropic leverages between three and six million, um, just to get us going. 
So we're being very strategic about diversifying um, the resources and support to this work, um, both in, in, in capital and uh, human capacity as well. Great, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any other commission comments or questions? Um, whether it's this um, catalyzing community giving, BCU, United Way, any of the other groups that are presenting tonight, um, and I don't expect an answer at this moment, but um, like, how are we going to track the return on investment? Um, you know, if we're giving a million and if you if you're getting a million and a half dollars and you give training like job training or whatever to five people, I mean, what? How are we going to um, make sure that there is that return on investment? Whether and I don't care what the project is, but I mean, I think Rebecca, this is directed at you more than anyone else. Um, you know, that's a lot of money. And I don't want to be kind of looking five years down the road going, gosh, that was a huge waste of dollars. And whether that's, again, the, the community giving or refer, refurbishment of McCamley Plaza Hotel and whatever iteration that becomes, um, people have a lot of good ideas and a lot of good intentions. And I just wanna make sure that, that any ARPA dollars that come from the city for these programs are, um, we get something for them. Sure, I'll Hi. go in uh, real quick over 30 seconds. Uh, from a catalyzing community giving standpoint, all of our work is grounded in evaluation and impact because frankly, uh, the community, from what I hear in the community conversation, cannot afford to go back. It has to go forward. It's not even for me about the, the numbers, it's about seeing people's lives actually transformed and people succeeding. And so uh, that's the charge. So yes, we're working with you know Upshot Institute and, and we have our own evaluators actually doing surveys. So we make sure that again, our work is grounded in data, uh, grounded in continuous improvement. Um, again, for you guys, uh, but honestly for the people. Absolutely. And we are looking at um, extrapolating the BIPOC community and looking at 1% increase annually into um, the, the local uh, economy, at, uh, participation into the local economy. So we are looking at some really critical uh, and strong data points to be able to report back. What is that return on investment? What did that investment actually lead to? Did it lead to 1%? of this population now onboarding and becoming actively engaged into our local economy, therefore increasing our local GDP, therefore supporting a revitalization uh, across the board. Thank you. Rebecca, Thank I think you, we're Commissioner turn Sophia. It over to you. So noted. <laughs> um, I mean, the federal government's gonna make us report on most of that, but certainly we will work with any and all community partners to make sure we're tracking the return on investment. So thank you very much, Commissioner Sophia. I appreciate that. Um, I am going to now turn it over. We're going to skip a couple of, of our party projects and go over to Alyssa Stewart, and she's going to talk about um, supporting the United Way. Thank you so much. And um, excited to be here and um, honored and honestly feeling hopeful and inspired to hear from Joe and BCU and my colleagues um, and friends, um, Will and Dr. Bayless and all the awesome work they're doing. And Will, thank you for teeing me up. Um, and I really do see this disaster relief fund work as a compliment. It's complementary um, and symbiotic with the awesome work that has been happening with the village. Um, so just a, a quick brief history, United Way's disaster relief fund, um, United Way uh, in Battle Creek has a long history of being responsive in times of crisis. I think of the straight winds um, some years ago, um, the Uber shooting, um, other things we have um, launched episodic disaster relief fund grant making. Um, in light of COVID, we activated our disaster relief fund. Um, and in our two activations for COVID-19, we distributed uh, around 2.5 million to Battle Creek. Uh, uh, to over 30 nonprofit organizations uh, and public entities doing direct crisis response work 
focused on meeting the basic needs of our neighbors in Battle Creek. And we are excited to think about how we can um, utilize ARPA dollars to continue to meet some of our community's most urgent needs. Um, so the ask that will be brought before you all is for 250,000. Um, we know that these funds will need to be kept in line with obviously the, the stringent requirements from the Department of Treasury. So we acknowledge that our disaster relief fund, a key um, element of it has been that it has been very low barrier. It has been very accessible um, and um, really flexible to meet the needs of community. Um, so while we are committed to applying everything that we have learned from the disaster relief fund, as far as our community's most urgent needs uh, and, and the amazing organizations that we have in our community to meet those needs, uh, we just want to affirm that we would really work closely with the city to ensure that we are in compliance uh, with all of the parameters um, of ARPA within that bucket of the negative impacts of COVID. Um, so we uh, would be utilizing again our equity lens, our commitment to making this opportunity as accessible as possible so that the nonprofits in our community could access these federal resources. Uh, the priority areas for the Disaster Relief Fund, again, are basic needs areas, food, shelter, other basic needs. Um, in the COVID pandemic, it's been things uh, like vaccinations, other health-related needs that really uh, mitigate the public health risks and implications of COVID-19. We've also addressed um, more tangential uh, barriers like things related to childcare, access to work, um, and other things related to that 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 COVID has really created impacts in. Uh, just to proactively answer uh, Commissioner Sophia's question, uh, an, a great part of our disaster relief fund work in any of our responsive grant making is that there are very clear outputs and outcomes. This work, um, our response work will really be output driven. So any grantees um, for these dollars will directly report to the outcomes, pounds of food, meals, you know, really those direct uh, basic needs outputs. So that is what we would commit to reporting back and bringing back to this commission for our accountability. Any other so, questions for United Way? Can I just have a really quick question and it's gonna maybe be for Rebecca. Have we as a city contributed to the disaster relief fund in the past? We, we contributed to the, the emergency response consortium. Um, but not direct cash into the disaster relief fund. Uh, Commissioner Blood. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm sure this is a yes, but just to put this question out there because uh, I'm sure others in the community are thinking um, thinking it. So I know we are united way of Battle Creek and Kalamazoo. Mm -hmm. So I am guessing you are also making an ARPA request of Kalamazoo. Um, is it appropriate to discuss to say maybe uh, how that presentation went and um, is it something comparable to also what you're asking from Battle Creek? Yeah, so uh, each municipality's process is slightly different. We are in conversation with our uh, the other municipalities in our footprint, um, but nothing has progressed to um, to approval, I would say. So many of our are in similar stages to, to you all and sort of having initial conversations and planning. Um, yeah, we, we have had this conversation um, with other municipalities and we're excited because we feel that that could give us um, uh, the ability to be more responsive to our nonprofit partners, many of whom um, function and serve people across our region. So with each um, you know, partnership, we would obviously be committed to deploying those dollars really well in service of each community. Um, but yes, so we are, but uh, nothing is final. So I would hate to disclose anything in advance of anything being committed. Absolutely, thank you for letting me know. I appreciate that. Absolutely. And Alyssa, is it fair to say too that you've also spoken to Calhoun County and have talked similar um, support? We've had and yep, an initial conversation with um, our friends in at Calhoun County. Correct. Um, yep, absolutely. Okay. Any other commission questions? If not, Rebecca, go on. Yep. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, for the next two projects, I'm going to turn it over to Ted. I think I am. <laughs> okay, there, 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 okay. we, got, we got it now. So, hey, thank you quickly. I'll, I'll try to get through this quickly too. And I'm certainly happy to answer any questions the commissions may have too. But 
Um, you know, I think commissioners are aware of the fact that several years ago we purchased the property. Well, we acquired the property at 135 North Washington, which we refer to as the Dollar Building through the GSA. And the property is right across the street from the Federal Center and right next to our fire station number two. And, and we were actually able to secure that property for a relatively nominal amount because it was being transferred from the government, the federal government to a local unit of government for a public purpose. And you may recall, we originally intended to use the building to support emergency services. And while we have been able to do that to some extent, we've also used the building for some general storage. And the GSA is looking to resolve any conflict that exists between how we're actually using the building and the original intent when the building was acquired. So the, the property is in a good location. Uh, we have been approached about the property a couple of different times about its availability for development. It is roughly uh, six acres and can support a wide variety of development, including multifamily housing. And in order for the property to be used for anything other than a very limited set of uses under the GSA program, we need to purchase it at market value, at which point then there would be no more restrictions on its use. And because we know that in the community, we have a wide need for a variety of housing types, everything from supportive housing right through market rate, uh, with a particular focus on affordable housing, uh, as it relates to the allocation of our ARPA dollars, we know that housing, particularly affordable housing, is an eligible expense. And so we see an opportunity here now to support and invest in housing solutions through the purchase of this particular property. Um, because we're recommending using ARPA dollars for the purchase, we're suggesting that the purchase then be tied to the idea that the future development of the property would be for affordable housing. So the city does not have a lot of large parcels of this size for future development. I believe commissioners are aware of the fact that we do have a tax credit developer who has expressed some interest in this site. But what we want to say today is the authorization to purchase this when it comes but uh, it doesn't come with any particular notion of how the property would be developed. So no particular development in mind. Um, what happens at the site, we ultimately want to be determined by the community, um, although the intent would be for some form of affordable housing. So we have cleared all of the hurdles with the GSA at this point to purchase the property. All we need to do essentially is write them a check, although there is some urgency as I indicated because they would like us to resolve the situation in the short term, uh, given our intent for the property's future. Um, and also given the fact that we aren't really truly using it now as, as was originally intended. So is there any questions I could answer about the Dolliver site real quick? Commissioner Morris and then Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so first I wanna say that it's important to state that Whatever agreement we do, we need to make sure that we have the language that we want Washington Heights businesses involved in the maintenance, because I think it's important to keep Washington Heights involved in this and not just have outside entities coming in and running it, because this is something that will change the culture of Washington Heights if we do decide to go through with this. Um, yeah, that's all I got, thank you. Vice Mayor. I know that there was one initial conversation held, a community conversation regarding the Dolliver site, and I'm wondering if you could tell us just a brief statement about how that went. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I did have an opportunity to participate. I think we did, you know, we had a, a, a core group of folks from that neighborhood. We would have loved to have, and I think the group that was there indicated they'd like to see us connect with more individuals from that neighborhood. I think it's very important, as Commissioner Morris pointed out, the neighborhood have a say in how this property developed. Now, again, we had a particular developer there that had a particular kind of housing in mind for that site, and that may or may not be a good fit once we have a broader community conversation about what the neighborhood would like to see there. So I think if anything came out of that conversation, it was, a, it was more of a, a concerted uh, commitment to involving the Washington Heights area in any decision about how that property would be developed. You know, I, Hard to say that there was any consensus coming out of that meeting. I do think there was some recognition that there could be some value here as affordable housing. We just had to define with the neighborhood what that means and what that looks like. So there, there was a basic interest though in affordable housing, but maybe not particularly by 
the the people that were present by the by the um by the agency that was present i should say yeah or maybe the type of housing that was being proposed yeah. might be a more accurate uh, assessment commissioner or vice mayor um I think that the group that was there understands that the opportunity for the city to use ARPA dollars here is tied to the notion of affordable housing because it's an eligible expense, then it just becomes right. What does the development actually look like? Okay. It's just hard for me to square away in my mind going forward with this type of investment when we don't know yet what the community desires. So that, that that's just where I am in my mind right now. Thank you. Commissioner comments? Actually, excuse me, Mayor, I have a comment. So um, Vice Mayor Ferris, I was also at that meeting. Um, and since then, I have attended three other community meetings in the Washington Heights area where that project has been talked about. Um, what I felt and, and the consensus of the room that I got from it was the type of housing was not what we felt was needed in Washington Heights. Um, the type of housing that was suggested was um, for the formerly homeless population and, and not for low-income families. And, and that was the consensus that I got from the three other meetings I've been at since this one was that there needed to be more low-income family housing for that Washington Heights area going along with the fact that there is an elementary school that backs up to the property and a daycare across the street. Seems like a, a prime position for low income family housing. And there was also talks about another meeting to take place or some community meetings to take place between the facilitators of this said meeting that we were at minus the developers and the actual community of Washington Heights. So that will be coming here in, in soon days. Commissioners, any other questions? I just wanted to thank Commissioner Herring for, for making that delineation that, um, you know, I, I think that the site could be great for low income housing to suit the needs of the immediate neighborhood, maybe not necessarily um, other groups that may be coming from outside of the neighborhood. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that we're continually listening to the neighbors um, the direct neighbors to this property as we move forward. So thank you for that. Yeah, and and if those I notes, just... I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and go those ahead. notes are recorded just so we know, and we can probably get a copy to the commission as well. Yeah, and I, I think what we just want to make sure is that, right, we have not, we have not committed to any project, I, and we probably shouldn't even be using that terminology. Um, we are committed to affordable housing on this location, and we believe that that, you're right, what that looks like um, in support of the neighborhood and the Washington Heights community, we need to work together to figure out what that is. So, you know, finding the right model that fits so that it's accessible by the residents uh, and the community members in Washington Heights. Rebecca, um, I don't think there's any other commission comments. You can take it from there. Thanks. Uh, Ted? Great. Sarah, thanks if you just scroll up there. Um, so the commission adopted a hotel motel ordinance back in the fall of last year. And after Ted, we're having a little trouble with your microphone. Okay. Um, You're really quiet. Let me see if I can. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little louder. Does that okay. help? Yep, okay. thanks. I'll speak a little louder. Sorry for being a little quiet there. So. Uh, again, the commission adopted a hotel motel ordinance last fall, uh, and after a six month delay, the full enforcement of that ordinance is expected to take place this fall. Uh, and that includes enforcement of the long term stay provisions that require that certain kitchen facilities be available to occupants who are staying more than 30 days. And Marcy and her team have continued to have a dialogue um, with hotel motel owners and a couple of things have become evident as part of those conversations. The first is that while most of the hotelers have registered the properties as required under the ordinance, we haven't really seen any indication that any investment is forthcoming to support the long-term stays. And while the ordinance doesn't require the owners of the hotels to make that investment, it's a little troubling to us because it appears that the number of local users who are using hotels and motels for long-term stays is actually larger 
than what we originally or what we originally anticipated. And that's particularly true in the summertime. But one of the very intriguing ideas that has come out of those conversations is the idea of a communal kitchen setup that would then comply with the ordinance and serve the long-term yeah, stay need. Um, after, you know, after further reviewing that idea, it appears that there's an idea that can work uh, around communal kitchens if we make sure that there are certain parameters in place. And Marcy and Rick Bullock, our chief building official, have worked that out and have made a recommendation about what a communal kitchen might look like. It would include, for example, as a minimum, a sink and a faucet, a refrigerator, a couple of range, you know, a couple of ranges, some counter space, you know, multiple electrical outlets, and, and, and a few things along those lines. And then accompanying any of those community, uh, communal kitchens, uh, every designated long-term stay unit would be required to have a microwave and a storage cabinet that would then store things like cooking supplies and pots and pans and, and that kind of thing. So owners would be required to have at least one communal kitchen for every eight units provided for long-term stays. Uh, and one additional requirement would be that they would then be responsible for cleaning that kitchen on a daily basis. So, you know, obviously from the owner's perspective, it's going to be more affordable to have a communal kitchen uh, as opposed to having uh, equipped each individual room for long-term stays. I know Marcy and her team have put together some preliminary estimates to address the cost of a kitchen or a communal kitchen and some of the needed room upgrades. The number that we've included as a priority project here, the 775,000, that represents the cost to provide 12 of our 14 hotels in our community with up to 40 long-term stay units served by communal kitchens. Then there would be 13 in one of our smaller hotels, and we did not include McCamley Plaza in this calculation. So what that means is ultimately, if, if, if the entire investment was made, there'd be 493 units of long-term stays available amongst roughly about 1,182 units on the market, so roughly 40%. Uh, and that number represents about $1,600 uh, per unit of long-term stay in terms of investment. So we haven't determined exactly yet how to distribute the funds. So whether that would be a, a low interest loan or a forgivable loan, or even a combination potentially of grants and loans. Um, where there is some urgency is to address this given the time frame of the ordinance. And we know that there has been some discussion about perhaps extending our current moratorium on enforcement. And that would probably be very helpful if we were to put a program like this in place, but we would know at least then as we were extending it, that there would be some type of actionable result at the end that would lead to addressing some of these needs. Um, I do wanna say that Marcy and her team have done the best they can to estimate the costs in what we know is a relatively volatile construction environment. Um, and again, Hotelers are not obligated to make this investment, but if they don't, then they risk their license if they allow, you know, if they allow long-term stays. Um, and some of our local service agencies have told us, you know, flat out that they're going to continue to make these referrals and use these services for their families. And despite the fact that we do a lot of case management in this community, there are still some significant barriers to access. And, and then ultimately that's what drives people to live in hotels. So we, we think this is a smart investment that will certainly help support the transition of some of our local residents to more permanent housing in the future. But this would be a, a, a good solid short-term solution. Questions of Ted? Mayor, so, I may. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kathy. Thank you. I just have a, a question about um, this is a, a great temporary solution. I think I want to applaud Marcy and her team for thinking innovatively about what's possible because, you know, that um, resolution was passed before ordinance before we were um, uh, on board for those of us who are new. And I know that it, it, it worried me about the long term impact of it. I'm curious about the residents who've been engaged, who find themselves tenants of these long-term stays at hotels. Were they engaged in that process with you? Were you able to um, talk to them about possibilities as well? I think Marcy's done it. Might be a question for Marcy. Yeah, Marcy's here on the call too, and I think she can speak to that. 
So we've had some limitations in regards to local service providers being able to do outreach because certainly they have very specific funding that defines the type of service and outreach that they can do. So we do not have outreach um, workers in um, agencies or organizations that are helping to serve individuals who are either homeless or transitioning. Those are usually limited to individuals who are in fact homeless. So because these individual, the families are, do have an occupancy somewhere, it limits their ability to do outreach. Certainly from a local government standpoint, we do not have staffing or capacity um, to be able to do that type of work ourselves. So we would rely on our community partners to do that. One of the things that came out of the last discussion that we had that included the property owners and also local service providers was some exploratory dialogue from some of our social service agencies to talk about how they can begin to communicate what services and programs we do have available in our community that may assist individuals and families who are faced with barriers that are preventing them from being able to access permanent housing. And so um, that, those are discussions that are happening in those social service um, larger conversations throughout the community. Okay, I think there was another commissioner that had a question or comment. It was Heron. me, Mayor. Mayor, yep. Commissioner Reynolds, yes. But thank you so much. Marcy answered the questions for me and so did Kathy. So thank you so much, Kathy, for bringing that uh, to point. And thank you, Marcy, for all that you are doing um, with our community. Appreciate that. I'm all set, Mayor, thank you. I do have a question, if I may, Mayor. Yes. Um, and this may be a little jumping ahead. I have, I have concerns about the fact that only under 600,000 of that money would be, is available for other things such as community work. Um, some of the things that have been happening in this city, such as the survey has shown or has highlighted things such as safety that need to be addressed in the city. And I'm wondering what can we do to make sure that more of that money goes towards things that, are, that, that go to the community? Like our, don't our people deserve some of that funding to uh, help them through what COVID has put them through? And I appreciate all the hard work that was done, but I would really like to see some more of that, of that funding go towards the actual community. So let me just clarify if I understand as far as safety, um, because certainly that was high on our list as we talked through. So, you know, one of the, the larger line items that we have as far as a recommendation is to assist with utility bills. Again, mm -hmm. we're looking at ways that we can get dollars directly into our residents' hands that have been great, the most impacted by COVID. And we know that though we've had a moratorium on water shutoffs, um, and we have people who just aren't working or out of work and aren't, pay, aren't they don't have the ability to pay their utility bills. We thought that that might be one way to assist those that are you know, most challenged from an economic development way. I mean, so that was one, um, the, the one area that we addressed that could, uh, that fit into one of the four ARPA buckets. Again, here is some of our limitations is it has to meet the requirement. So advance, So when we were just talking about the, um, the communal kitchens, you know, we could never develop um, low income or affordable housing units for $1,600 each. So this was a way to, to create some housing for our some of our most challenged persons and families, um, and then try to get them to transition from those long-term hostel stays that now at least have the amenities that will allow them to stay there safely right. into then recognizing the barriers that aren't getting them into more permanent housing options, which is what Marcy was describing, working with our social service providers um, and even the work that Chris Lucy and his team are doing, we know some of those, we know the barriers, whether they have a felony conviction, whether they have evictions, um, whether they have poor credit, 
um, or, or any of those kind of strikes, that's not helpful. So how can we then work with property owners to take chances on second chance renters and or owners? So, you know, again, we, you know, we're, we're attempting to um, address some of the, the basic needs and meet the parameters of ARPA. If I could also um, add, one of the factors as we talk about um, individuals and families that are living in hotels and motels for long-term stay is that we anticipate that as a, a greater community and region that with um, the moratoriums being lifted on evictions that were put in place during COVID, that we anticipate that um, that is certainly going to impact our community residents and that there will be individuals and families displaced who may only find themselves in situations where they can not secure permanent housing and may be forced to live in hotels and motels. And so this is a way to um, help provide some opportunities for safe housing in the interim as people transition during the impact that we are anticipating with the what we're figuring is gonna be an eviction crisis perhaps um, because of COVID. Any other commission comments or questions? Rebecca? Uh, Mayor, I think we should just open it up for commission discussion. We can certainly at a later time talk through, um, you know, how we use the new priority-based budgeting community results and definitions. We've clearly identified kind of those areas um, for the projects that we we recommended. So I think it would be best because I know we're short on time. It's just to open that up for commission discussion um, at this time. Okay, let's do that. Um... Commissioner Wilson, would you like to start us off and then we'll go across the... Uh... Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, that's what I get for logging in early and getting to the top of the screen, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I hope that you all had an opportunity to look at the proposal that was co-authored by myself, um, Vice Mayor Ferris, Commissioner Herring, Commissioner Blood, um, that really highlight, uh, highlights our desire to have um, some of these funds allocated for the community around innovation, incubation, and acceleration. Um, we have a long history in this community of really behaving in that way. It's part of our, our DNA. And we wanna see us really provide um, almost a shot in the arm, that pun is attended, right? pun intended, um, to the community through the use of some of these funds that could be allocated through an RFP process, et cetera, that would really help lift up things like our local artists who are really wanting to um, recreate what Battle Creek is through the use of their creative um, outlets. Uh, we've got musicians we have talked to, um, some street artists we've got, um, we have an international firm that's interested in what it would look like to actually create um, Battle Creek into a music city. Um, and what that would do for our local economy. We think it aligns well with our priority around the economy when we look at our priority-based budgeting uh, process. So we're asking that um, when we, it does come time for us to be allocating resources, that we take a look at how we can um, have a set aside that would be for that. And I would ask my other commission commissioners to join in on anything I've missed. But before I turn the mic over, just um, I wanna thank everybody who brought the projects to us this evening. I think that there's a lot of value here. Rebecca, I appreciated you wrapping up how this aligns with those buckets with ARPA and that this is you know, the thought process that's going into that. I do think that it is also an opportunity for us to really help our community see um, their way of interacting with us and contributing to decision-making. So I don't, I don't wanna lose that opportunity. So it's not just us saying, here's what we're doing because we know what's best for us because a lot of this stuff is really well thought out, but how do we make sure that we're actually engaging? And so mm -hmm. I think as commissioners play a really important role in that. And I think that each one of us has been trying to listen. Um, and then one last thing, and then um, I'll ask them to also um, reply about what we had sent you. But um, I also just wanna continue to lift up um, the vulnerability of our childcare sector and how we really need to be thinking about those who provide the care for the children in our community so that we can all work. 
Yes. Those of us who have young children. And so let's just, um, as we're thinking about this, I actually think that this is not about us supporting child care. This is about us creating a business sector, an industry that is actually sustainable and strong on its own. And so that's going to require us to think differently, right? So our economic developers, I'm not sure Joe is still on the call, has been now a part of a lot of the conversations we've been having, and we're seeing um, a mindset shift. And so I just, I invite each of you to continue to do that with yourselves and always give me a call if you have any questions, because I'm happy to answer them. And then I'll um, release the rest of my time if I had any left. <laughs> and Commissioner Blood, I saw your hand up if you wanted to contribute anything more about the proposal we wrote. Uh, Commissioner Blood. Yes, thank you, um, Mayor and Commissioner Zenda Wilson. So I concur with my uh, fellow commissioners, Herring, Zenda Wilson, uh, in the sense that um, these monies, this impact, this is the moment we have to be bold and to listen to the community and let them be the driving force. As we um, listen to Dr. Um, Bayless, their, their focus is not on having entities come in and say, this is how um, we're going to do it, but listening to the community and that's the driving force. You know, uh, and, I, and, I, and I, when I say this comment, um, this is off the cuff and I, I say it respectfully, um, but it's something that kind of crossed my mind in the sense that, um, uh, Vice Mayor, you were so correct. It's a drop in the bucket for the village, 1.5 million. Um, when, when, you know, we're, and, I, and it's not that I don't value the project at McCamley, but that's 2.5 million. And, you know, um, how do we look at this and try to take this money and distribute it in a way that is bold and it's aggressive for our community in a way that lifts many up? Um, I'm glad that we're getting innovated. I, innovative. I was delighted to hear, um, you know, Miss Gillette and her team come up with this communal kitchen. You know, you have those in colleges and dorm rooms. You have so many rooms, you have that communal kitchen. That's great. That's fantastic. Think outside the box um, for solutions. Yes, it may be temporary, but what can we do long term? Um, but also, I know we need to backfill. I know we need to support um, loss. Um, but I, I don't want this to be a moment in which we aren't bold and we aren't thinking big. And um, I, I'd like to see us do that as a city. Um, we were on the map once as an innovative place uh, where kings and queens used to come. Um, you know, there's no reason we can't be that still. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I. I, my concern right now, listening to all of my uh, counterparts here, getting this information out to the community, I go to a lot of these community meetings and the community is not there. It's just basically leaders. And I want us to get out and, and get the community involved in making these decisions because this is where they live. So I just want to see us maybe do something live, something big, and make it something where they all can join in and have a conversation and be part of what we're trying to do. Because Thank at this point, me. they don't have that. They don't have that voice at all. It's Thank the you. same people all the time. So I'd like for us to work on that. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Back to um, Commissioner Zenda Wilson's comments and the proposal that was set forth uh, by myself and fellow commissioners. I just wanna make sure that people realize what an impact, what a negative impact COVID had on the economy um, for local artisans, um, whether that be visual artists, musicians, writers, et cetera. Um, they, that's like the first thing that people stop paying for, right? Those are considered luxuries in our society, but they're also essential when it comes to lifting the human spirit and when it comes to forming community and forming local culture. So I wanna make sure that um, as we are rebuilding ourselves after COVID, we don't underestimate um, 
the impact that COVID has had on our collective psyche and on, um, you know, this has been a traumatic event for, for us as a nation. And so as we rebuild, the arts can't be overlooked. And um, I just wanna make sure that um, folks keep that at, at the head of their mind and, um, and, and realize that it's not just a frivolous thing. It's a, it's an, a real driver of economy and um, by uplifting our, our greater society, it will drive economy in ways that we haven't even dreamed of yet. Thank you. All right, let's go to Commissioner Morris and then after Commissioner Morris, Commissioner Lance. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have any questions. I would just like to thank everyone for the work that they've done. And I would like to point out that we need to remain transparent um, not just with the commissioners, but with the community as well. Make sure that we keep on going to these community conversations and getting the actual voice of the community and bringing it back here where we actually make the changes because we need to get the voices of the community and see what they want before we just make decisions for our whole community. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lance. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I guess I, I, I envision um, the use of money this $30 million, um, I, I would hate to see us spend it all and look around in a few years and say, wow, what did we just spend that on? Um, anecdotally, oftentimes when I'm advising clients on, <laughs> on distribution of wealth, uh, you know, we put levels in there because I know if I was 18 and got a bunch of money, I probably would blow it all as opposed to if I was 30. And I look at this, this ARPA funds and I, I think we have that ability to, I think Commissioner Blood said, to be bold. But being bold also means to me that whatever we invest in, whatever we put our money into, that it can be sustainable um, and, quite frankly, that it earns us back money. And so, to me, my focus on, on what we do with this money, at least one of my buckets, is to ensure that when we give money, um, while there are no guarantees, it's that we try to create a new revenue source from that money so that if we invest money into something, we're going to get an ROI. We're going to get that return on investment that's double, triple, quadruple times. So those are the things that I, I guess I'm trying to be mindful when we examine um, the, the ask for, for this money. And community engagement's wonderful, um, but, but so is business engagement. So... Um, I appreciate everybody who presented tonight, and of course, the, uh, the comments and, and observations made by my fellow commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lance. Let's go to Commissioner Sophia, Herring, and then myself. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've heard a lot of um, admonitions tonight to be bold, and um, kind of following up on Commissioner Lance, I would like us to be responsible. Um, I, we can fund 20, if I, if my math is correct, we're funding about 20% of the asks that we got. Um, so I want to make sure that, you know, down the road, we're not thinking, gosh, those monies could have been better used by one of that 80% that didn't get what they were asking for. So that's all I have to contribute at this point. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Herring. I also agree. And I think maybe bold is not the word I would use. Let's be, I, I don't even have a word for it. I just wanna make sure that the people of Battle Creek, the community, the residents, the ones that we represent, the ones that voted us in feel some of that help. I, I wanna make sure. And, and I know there are a couple, a couple things on this list that would directly affect them, but this amount of money is life-changing for a whole city. Like not just business-wise, but like family-wise, job-wise, you know, education-wise, culturally. Like there's so many opportunities that we have with this money. I just don't wanna see it all go to stuff that is not directly affecting our community. Thank you. And with that being said, I, I agree with Commissioner Herring. Um, we need to be effective. We need to be responsible. And um, 
I believe that everyone here has good intentions at making certain that we spend the taxpayers' monies that have been allocated for Battle Creek effectively. And I think our city manager has made that proposal. And I think it now is gonna be up to the city commission at some point in time to either vote up or down on uh, how these monies will be proposed or be spent in Battle Creek. So Rebecca, have you received the information that you need? Do you need additional direction? Um, uh, no, Mayor, I, you know, I think what we want to do is take all of these conversations back um, into senior staff and into our leadership team um, to, I, you know, to determine next steps. We, all, we always knew that there would be additional conversations. Um, there, again, there are some projects that, that need to advance based on you know, kind of where they're at. And so I'll make sure that I communicate that with the commission prior to them advancing to an agenda. Um, but yeah, we have a lot to, to kind of digest um, in, in this information and in the comments. Um, and then we'll, we'll come back to the commission uh, again in a forum and maybe it's a conversation that happens. And then the commission, uh, please let us just give, get a, give a chance to think about all the input that we've received, talk with our community partners that were with us this evening um, and then come back with a, a plan, the next steps. Vice Mayor, were you able to do public comments at the beginning of the workshop? We did, but um, at that point, there was no one in the queue. I'm not sure if we want to touch back on that now. All right. Um, Sarah, do you have any, anyone in the queue that would like to make a public comment? We do have a caller, Mayor, um, with the last four digits of 8773 that joined the meeting late, if we would like to check in with them. All right. If you would like to speak, um, last the caller with 8773, I think you hit star six raise your hand and then start night to unmute yourself. Good evening. Um, this is Pastor Monique French from Washington Heights United Methodist Church. Welcome, Pastor. Thank you. I just wanted to thank um, the community partners for their hard work that they're doing in the community. But I wanted to um, say a special thank you to Commissioner Herring and Morris for bringing out the point of being committed to hearing the hearts and keeping the community of Washington Heights residents involved in the process. Also, I wanna thank um, Commissioner Reynolds for remembering, stating remembering the community because you don't wanna break that trust and the community, if they're not involved in a process, the trust would be broken. And that is a lot of the uh, comments that I hear and getting the information out in a timely manner so that the community can be present at those meetings is very important because I've only um, been privileged to one meeting and I found out about that just, you know, very shortly before the meeting happened and I had a prior engagement, so I wasn't able to be um, a part of that meeting. And I live in the Washington Heights community, so I do want to be involved in the process and the things that are happening here because I'm committed to this community because I am a resident here. And I thank you, um, Mayor, for the opportunity to speak. And Pastor, we appreciate your new involvement in our community. It shows that you really believe in the Washington Heights community. And we want to say thank you very much for putting up with us for two hours tonight. Thank you. All right. Are there any other public comments? No, Mayor. There are no other callers in the meeting. Thank you very much, Sarah. All right. I'll give one last chance for anyone to speak. Um, I'm not seeing you on any Let's say good night. Thank you very much. And please have a good evening.